morning and welcome to Salem Chapel. We're so glad you're joining us today. We know getting connected to a new church can be hard. If you're new to Salem Chapel or if you've been coming for a few weeks and are ready to take your next steps, we would love to make that as easy as possible. There are two ways we can help. Stop by the Welcome Center on your way out or you can visit salemchapel.org slash hello at any point this week. After that, one of our staff members will follow up with you later this week to help you get connected here at Salem Chapel. It's been a while since we've had events just for the guys and ladies, so we are excited for our upcoming men's and women's events on Saturday, March 16th. Both events are happening in the brand new M3 Innovation Center and will give you a chance to catch up with some other men and women of Salem Chapel, get introduced to new friends, and learn about how Jesus makes a difference in the midst of everything going on in our day-to-day life. The men are up first from 8 to 9.30 a.m., then it's the ladies' turn from 10 to 11.30 a.m. You can find all the details and register now on our events page. Families, are you looking for an opportunity for some family time while also getting to meet and hang out with other people? At our annual Easter egg trunk hunt, your kids will hop from trunk to trunk collecting candy and toy-filled Easter eggs. We will also be making balloon animals and the struggle bus will be selling coffee and baked goods. Don't have kids? Not a problem. You can grab some coffee while supporting local businesses and spending time with your church family. We will need volunteers to provide decorated trunks and candy. You can sign up to volunteer and learn more at salemchapel.org slash events. Have you ever wondered what baptism is, why people do it, and if it's something that you should do? If so, we'd like to invite you to join us for a baptism workshop where Pastor Mark will walk through the biblical basis for baptism, explain what it is and is not, and answer your questions about baptism. This workshop is for those who have general questions about baptism, those who desire to be baptized, or even someone who's already been baptized but wants to better understand for themselves or to be able to explain it better to someone else. Our next baptism workshop will be held on Sunday, March 24th. Then on Easter Sunday, March 31st, we will be having baptism services. You can sign up to be baptized and attend our baptism workshop at salemchapel.org slash baptism. Easter weekend is right around the corner. On March 29th, we are having two identical Good Friday services where we will reflect on the love Jesus displayed by being the perfect sacrifice for our sins on the cross. Then on March 31st, we will celebrate our risen King, This is going to be a special weekend, and we look forward to spending it with you and your family. You can learn more about everything else happening at Salem Chapel by visiting our website at salemchapel.org. Church, let's stand as we enter into a time of worship together. Well, good morning, church. As we gather in today, we've come to give thanks to the Lord, to bless His name. So let's lift our voices together. We sing, wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Yeah, this bag bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win a fight. I'm slowly drifting. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my choice but to believe my doubts are burning yeah. like ashes in the so so all of my old friends burning and bitterness you can just keep it moving uh, now you ain't welcome here for 
Well, good morning, church. Um, before we go any further in the service this morning, we want to stop and celebrate uh, more of what God is doing in the life of our church. It seems like he's doing so many amazing things right now, but something today that we're really excited about is that this coming weekend, this coming Saturday, we are sending our next team of short-term missionaries to the Dominican Republic. Uh, if you remember, uh, last year, we sent our first team of 12 uh, brave souls to go down and, and face the unknown, uh, looking for the for what God would have us do in partnership uh, with our, our missions partner, Pathway Dominicana, uh, and the local churches there in the Dominican Republic, just to see uh, what is the opportunity here for the gospel. And so uh, again, this year, uh, this team of 15, which I'm gonna introduce in a minute, are going forth in the footsteps of the team before to step into those roles. We're working in uh, the sugarcane villages there around the city of San Pedro, uh, two villages that we were introduced to last year. We're working in those again, Aliman and La Cubana. And our team this year is gonna be doing kids ministry in the schools. Guys, the schools there just let you come in uh, for three hours and do whatever you want to. So guess what we're gonna do? <laughs> we're gonna give them Jesus, right? We're gonna have some fun with them. Really looking forward to seeing uh, what the, the gifts on this team, how those play out uh, in this trip. And we're also gonna be ministering and, and giving food and going door to door, meeting people and sharing the gospel with them in their homes while we are there. And so we're very excited for what God has already done in providing opportunity and relationship with other churches there in the DR and looking forward to what he is going to do today. So let me go ahead and introduce you to the team real quickly going with us uh, this year. This is Rohesh Fernando. He's gonna be going, he's actually teaching a uh, kid's Bible story for the first time, which I'm really pumped about. It'll be a lot of fun. And this is uh, Brian and Easton McWhorter going together there. And then, then the Sophie Van Zant right there. There's Aaron and Pam Murray. There's my daughter, Charlotte, going with me this year. That's really fun for me. There's Lexi Dames right there beside of her. And Ashton Chin, who actually went last year, so she's a veteran this year with me. And then Pastor Phil uh, going to join us this year as well. And guys, we're really excited to see how God uses the gifts. Uh, guys, what's the, what's the key word that I've been saying to you about this trip all along that we need to be prepared for? What is it? Flexibility, that's right, all right? Like we... We make our plans, all right? The heart of man makes his plans, but who directs the steps is the Lord, right? And we know that. And so we go with plans. We, take, we have our bags packed. Maybe we'll end up with them on the other side. We don't know. Uh, but the Lord is gonna make it clear what he wants us to do. And so Salem Chapel, these are your missionaries. I think that's important for you to remember that as well. Um, this is not just some people that are, that are going off from our church. These are your missionaries. This is a part of how we collectively make and mobilize disciples on a mission to reach every man, woman, and child, not just here, but around the world as well. Jesus called us to go and make disciples of all nations, right? And so uh, while maybe this is not the year that you get to step into that role, your friends, maybe some of these are your Salem kids leaders, maybe some, some people that you are in life group with, they are going representing first the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they're representing 
what God is doing in this place as well. And so I'd ask you in partnership with them to pray, right? By God's grace, he's already supplied all of the funds that we need for the trip this year. And that's exciting. That's something to celebrate too. But we would ask you to pray, to pray for each one. Like we're gonna have their names on a slide here on, on social media over the next week. I want you to be praying for them by name, that God would use them, that God would encourage them, that God would protect them. We're actually down a few this morning uh, that weren't able to be with us because they picked up a stomach bug. Um, but I, we'd ask that they would, God would heal them quickly uh, before we go, but just protect all of the, the logistics for travel. And we'll look forward to celebrating what God is gonna do there with us today. So what we're gonna do this morning, uh, sort of based off a of precedent from scripture, uh, as churches in the New Testament send out missionaries from them, uh, the, the pastors and elders would gather and lay hands on them and commission them as they went. So I'm gonna have Johnny to pray and the elders to come and lay hands on us this morning. These individuals a hand and encourage them. Man, I, I want you all to know I speak on behalf of all of us as elders how excited we are for each of you. Uh, man, how we are, will be praying for you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 calls us ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And uh, man, I'm so excited that we have all ages on this trip. And, and so would you pray for me as I, or would you pray with us as I pray out loud? Uh, God, I thank you so much this morning for each person that is on this stage, for those that are uh, getting over illness, Lord, that will be on this trip. Lord, we wanna first of all thank you, uh, Lord, that each person uh, felt and sensed that you were calling them to do this and they obeyed. And so, Lord, we wanna thank you first of all that they heard you and that they obeyed what you said. Lord, we wanna thank you for the reality that what you call us to, you also provide. And so, Lord, I want to thank you that you have provided the resources for every person on this team to be obedient to what you've called them to do. Lord, I thank you for this partnership that we have in the Dominican Republic with these churches. Uh, Lord, I, I, I just pray that you would continue to provide protection over these pastors and the people that make up those churches. Lord, uh, that uh, you would just continue to prepare the way for this team as they arrive uh, from the medical ministry that will go on to the ministry with children to the ministry to the churches. God, that you would allow this trip to be a watershed moment for each person that is a part of this team. And that, Lord, what you are, have allowed them to do, uh, Lord, in another country would just light a flame for what you want them to do in the mission field that you've placed them where they live, where they work, where they learn, where they play. So, Lord, I pray that logistically everything would go smoothly. The flight there, the luggage there, the supplies getting there, and that, Lord, this would be a trip, Lord, that would just be a watershed moment in their faith with you. And, Lord, I pray that we would see people come to know you as their Savior on this trip that we would see people not only uh, be able to receive medicine and healing for what ails them physically, but Lord, also, Lord, they would be healed spiritually. So Lord, we look forward to what you are gonna do. Thank you for the privilege to be able to send this team out. And as they go out, may they, uh, Lord, realize and be encouraged that we are going with them and we are praying for them. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, amen. Would you stand as we sing this next song?
how great you are, God. You've done great things in our lives. We hold on to you and the grace that's sufficient. It's by grace through faith alone that you save us, God. And you are greatly to be praised. We love you so much, Jesus. We take this time to just receive what you have for us, God. Please touch our hearts, God give this time to you, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So good to worship with you. You may have a seat. Thank you, Athena. Well, good morning. Welcome to Salem Chapel. Uh, Man, I hope that uh, when you came in today, you were ready to hear what God had to say to you today. Uh, We say here at Salem Chapel, if you're new with us, when God's word is open, his mouth is open. And so you don't need to pray, God, will you speak? Because he will, uh, because that's what his word does. We need to pray, God, would you give me ears to hear what you want me to hear today? And and Lord, uh, would you give me the strength to be obedient to what 
that is. I just want to mention a couple of things before um, I get started. First of all, if you're new with us, welcome to Salem Chapel. I know that's not easy to come into a place you've never been before. If you're watching us online, let me say welcome to you as well. My name's Johnny Pereira. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here. We are glad that you're here this morning. Uh, just a couple of things I want to make mention of. Uh, you'll, you'll see a little video at the end of uh, the service to remind you. Obviously, today, uh, some of you may not realize this, today is not the grand opening for the M3. Uh, there's still some things that need to be done, and we want to make sure they're done before we have everyone go through there. No one does a home reveal before it's done, and so we don't want to do that either. And so March 10th will be the date uh, that we will do that after both services and celebrate that. Uh, but another date that I haven't told you that I want to make sure you know of as well is March 17th. So the very next Sunday, we will uh, have a playground dedication. So the playground will officially open on March 17th. So if you have kids, uh, that will be a date because they are going to hear about that in Salem Kids that I promise you, they will not let you forget. So, so this little ramp that for the five, past five years has served as our Salem Kids playground, now you will have a playground in the back of the building that'll be a little bit more exciting, though we don't mind your kids running up and down the, the ramp either, so I don't want you to think that. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to do that we as elders just felt the Lord leading us to do is to be able to dedicate that playground, and we want to dedicate it in Wade Cochran's honor. And so some of you may know who Wade Cochran is. Uh, Wade uh, was adopted by Kent and Nikki Cochran and their family when he was two years old from India. Uh, he came to the United States. He was a part of this church. He came to Jesus in Salem Kids, which is an awesome thing. And so the Lord took him home last year in the month of December and uh, if you were here with us, you know, uh, especially if you were teaching in Salem Kids, how much the kids prayed for Wade to be healed and, and just what that really did in our church and really galvanizing us to really ask ourselves, okay, we've been saying, how does Jesus make a difference in our everyday life? And so this is an opportunity and also a time where we're tested in that. And so I'm so proud of you as Salem Kids workers who really stepped into that moment and really allowed the gospel and the hope that we have for eternity and your kids really being exposed for the first time that death is real. Uh, but what a story of God's power and presence and provision to walk through this family through a time that none of us can imagine if we haven't gone through that. And so we as elders believe that is a story that we want to continue on. And so uh, you'll see the sign there. The reason why there's a QR code there is because that sign will be on the wall uh, behind the playground so that every family that may be not familiar with Wade's story will be able to take their phone, take a picture of that QR code. It'll take them to a page on our website that has Kent and Nikki's video testimony that was shown at their funeral as well as the memorial service. And so we're praying that this playground will be used by God to draw new people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it gives you as an opportunity as a parent, if you're not familiar with that story, to be familiar with it so that you have an opportunity to share with your children how Jesus makes a difference for eternity and their everyday life. So that's March 17th. We'll do that after both services. That will be a special, special time that I want to make sure that you are aware of. All right, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 this morning. If you are new with us, we've been in this series walking through the book of Romans in a series that we've entitled The Power of the Gospel. Because this is a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes to this church some 2,000 years ago, a church that he's never met, but a church that he has heard has done so many, so many amazing things there in Rome and has stood in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul does more than any other letter is he really writes what the gospel is, the difference that it makes for your eternity, how it can, can, can enable you to have a relationship with God, but also how it impacts your everyday life, Without, which I don't know about you, but for me, there were many, many years that I knew how the gospel made a difference for my eternity, absolutely, but I wasn't sure how to make made a difference in my everyday life. Like if you were to ask me that question, man, even 10 years ago, I would have said, man, I know I'm supposed to know the answer to that question, but I'm not sure that I really do. And so what we're doing in this series is we're doing exactly what Paul did. 
is we are showing the significance and the power of the gospel for your eternity and your everyday life. And if there was ever a Sunday where that is going to be done, it's in these verses. Because Paul is really turning a page, right? We've, we've, we've kind of, you know, pulled up um, our pants a bit and waded into some deep waters, right? Romans 1 had some, had some difficult things in it, and Romans 2, and Romans 3, and Romans 4. Now we come to a passage of Scripture that if you were reading ahead in our sermon reading guide, which I encourage you to grab if you don't have one in our Welcome Center or on our website, you come to these 11 verses, you're like, ah, oh, finally something that I don't have to read five times that I someone understand. Anybody else like that? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. I was kind of excited just to be able to teach us. I'm like, oh, let me just take a sigh of relief a little bit. Like, like, okay, God, this is awesome. And man, this has encouraged me so much this week. And so I'm excited to share with you what God has encouraged me with. And I hope it's an encouragement to you. So let's start in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now what I don't want to do is take for granted that every person was here when we walked through Romans 3 and Romans 4. So I just want to take a moment and once again explain what justification means. Because it's mentioned in this passage of scripture, the effects of it, the benefits of it. So let's make sure we understand it once again. Justification is a legal term. The word that Paul uses in this passage in Romans 3 and Romans 4 is a legal term that means this. It's literally changing the judicial standard from someone who is guilty and moving them to someone who is innocent. So if you're standing in a courtroom and, and, and you are guilty, and that judge was to say, okay, no longer are you guilty, but now you are innocent, you have been declared justified. And the way that God does that with you and me who are sinners, who can't do anything to warrant a relationship with a holy God because God's perfect and you're not. Is God credited Jesus' righteousness, his perfect life, his death on the cross, his resurrection. He credited it to your account. So if you place your trust not in the good that you do to have a relationship with God, we looked at that last week, or the good that you do and faith in Jesus Christ, we looked at how that's not salvation because that's still of works, but if I place my trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and what he's done for me, and I place my faith in his performance and not my own, I am justified by God. This morning, even though we still sin, God sees us as individuals through Jesus Christ who are holy, who are righteous. And I don't know about you, but that is good news. We gave this definition of justification that's not new with me, but I think it's a definition that you can easily remember. Justification is this, just as if I never sinned. That's how God sees you. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And justification makes every difference in the world for your eternity. Like today, if you placed your trust in Jesus Christ, you no longer have to wonder, am I saved? Like if God took my life today, God forbid, am I going to be in heaven or am I not? The reason why you can have assurance of that is because your salvation isn't based on you. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. Justification makes every difference for your eternity. But here's what I want us to see this morning. Justification also makes a difference for your everyday. For your everyday life. And I would say this, that we actually realize that more in the difficult times than in the good times. And as we're going to see this morning, those difficult times are an invitation for God to show you how much he does love you and how his love actually does make a difference in your everyday life. And that's the purpose of these verses in 1 through 11. Literally, they are the benefits 
of you being justified by God through Jesus Christ. So here's the title of the message this morning. The gospel for today. Can we just say that word together today? The gospel for today. We're gonna focus this morning on today. Does that mean we're discounting eternity? Absolutely not. That's our hope. We'll touch on that this morning because Paul does. But I want us to focus on today. I want you to think about what are you struggling with today? Where are you doubting today? What emotions do you have today? What disappointments do you have today? Where have you experienced tragedy today? Whatever it is, I want you to focus on that today and pray and look forward to how these verses are going to speak, not necessarily to your eternity, although yes, but more importantly, say it with me, today, today. Here's the big idea, the main idea I want you to know today if you're taking notes. The power of the gospel is a difference maker, is the difference maker for navigating through this life. The power of the gospel is the, is your difference maker for navigating through this life. I just once again want to just encourage you that when you're reading the Bible, when you come to the word therefore, it's based on truths that precede that verse. And so like I said already, Paul says therefore, in other words, everything that we've looked at in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4, now Paul's going to say therefore, based on their, the reality that we can do nothing to have a relationship with God and be seen as righteous before God and because of everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for you and me, therefore, here are the benefits of being saved by grace through faith alone. So I first of all want to give you these, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. They were found in the verses that we read in verses 1 and 2. I want to give you three relational benefits that God gifts to you. Keyword gifts. You don't earn, but that he gifts to you through justification. Here's the first one. Unhindered peace with God. That's found in verse 1, right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ unhindered peace with God. That's one of the relational benefits that you receive through justification. Because of Jesus Christ, not you, not me, is I have unhindered peace with God this morning. Now here's what that peace is referring to. It's not referring to subjective peace. Because we've all experienced that, right? Like, oh, I actually had a good week this week, and I hope that's true for you. And you're like, you know what? A lot of things went my way. Uh, Circumstances went my way. Uh, Maybe even had something happen good at work or school or whatever uh, that may be. And, and, And because of that, I would say, you know, I'm in a pretty peaceful place. But that type of peace is extremely subjective, is it not? Because I hope this is not true, but something could happen today and you find yourself no longer in a peaceful place. But that's not the word in verse one. It's not a subjective peace. But this word peace is an objective peace. In other words, this is your reality whether you feel like it or not. Whether circumstances affirm it or not. That you have peace with God. And the reason why it's objective and the reason why it's immune to circumstances and immune to your feelings is because you didn't have anything to do with it. It's not based on your performance. It's based on Christ's performance for you. So you could have had a miserable week this week, and you could have been like, oh my goodness, I'm walking in here, I'm listening to this this morning, and I have so much shame, I have so much guilt, because I can't believe that I did that again. But what this verse is saying is is that doesn't affect your peace with God. Because your peace with God isn't based on the good that you do or the good that you don't do. It's based on the perfection that Jesus Christ did for you. And you have unhindered peace with God. There's nothing that you could do to take that away. Because you had nothing to do with it. You have unhindered peace with God. Here's the second thing, relational benefit. You have unlimited access to God. 
Like that's a relational benefit that God gives to you because you are justified by faith through Christ alone. You have unhindered access to God. What does it say at the beginning of verse 2? We also have obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. That word access literally means this in the Greek, which if you didn't know, the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And the word that's used for access is this, to bring near or to introduce. So in other words, if I was out in the lobby, which I am after every Sunday, and this happens every Sunday, and I love that it is, and if you're new here this morning, I would love to have this uh, true of you, and and sometimes I'll have a greeter come by, and they're like, hey, I want to introduce to you so-and-so. That's the word access. They are being given access to me. And I'm not saying that because you won't have access to me. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just, that's the word. You're introducing someone to someone else who didn't know them before. Now, here's the significance of that. God doesn't need to be introduced to you. Because God's always known you. He created you, as David says in the psalm, in your mother's womb. So God doesn't need to be introduced to you, but you know what does need to happen? You need to be introduced to him. This word carries with it such a beautiful idea of relationship, that God loves you so much that through Jesus, you come to the place where you're introduced to how much he loves you. how much he cares for you, to how he wants to offer you unhindered peace, and how he wants to offer to you unlimited access. See, sometimes we can so focus, and if this is true, this is wrong, but we can so focus on the negative with justification, like you're a sinner, you're deserving of hell, all of those things, and and, and yes, we're deserving of God's judgment because of our sin, because if God didn't judge sin, then he wouldn't be perfect, because that meant he wasn't just. So there is a negative aspect to justification. I have to realize I'm a sinner. But let's also emphasize the positive. That now that I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I can go to him whenever I desire, whenever I want. Why? Not because God's been introduced to me, but because I've been introduced to this loving relationship. Think about it. Have you ever had to go into your boss's office Right? Maybe you've got a question, or maybe it's review time, and you're like, oh, man, I'm dreading this. I got to go, in, or I have a question, and, and um, this, if you've ever been in a leadership position, you know this, sometimes you hear the, the, the faint knock at your door. Like, you guys can't even hear that, but I'm knocking. Right? Instead of like, that's a confident knock. That's like, I don't have to worry about, is the person going to be like, want to talk to me? But then it's like, and then, and then what do you say when you, when you open the door? I'm sorry, am I bothering you? Well, clearly not, because you knocked on the door. I didn't knock on the door. But how many of you do that, right? Before you ever talk to anyone, you're like, oh, I'm sorry I'm bothering you. Oh, I'm sorry that, 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 that I've come to you. Some of you are so scared to go to a person of authority. Why? Because there's a fear of rejection. There's a fear of shame. We all battle that. I'm no different than you. Because at the end of the day, I'm thinking, man, I'm not good enough. Man, I'm already struggling that this person sees me as inferior because I have a question. Or they see me as not good enough because I need to talk to them and I need to get clarity or whatever, whatever the case may be. But here's what I want you to know. That when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, if there was ever anyone that you should feel that way about, but God says, no, 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 no. You're my child because of Jesus Christ. There's never a knock on my door that I will not answer and be ready and lovingly want to have fellowship with you and have you talk to me and have you bring your cares to me and have you bring your fears to me. Why? Because when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, man, you have unhindered peace, but you have unlimited access to God. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this, for we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. There's Jesus' performance for you and me. So what's the result? Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. Not this dainty little knock, but like, Jesus, I need you right now. And I never have to wonder that I'm bothering you. I never have to wonder that you're too busy. I never have to wonder what are you going to think of me. That can't be the case. If I do that with you or you do that with me, why? Because there are times where we're like, I am too busy. I've already told you that I love you. I've already told you that I'm for you. I've already told you what to do, but not with God. We have unhindered access to God. What does it say? Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Unhindered peace with God, unlimited access to God. Here's the third thing, unshakable hope in God. Because what does it say at the end of verse two? And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You're like, Johnny, I thought this says there's not supposed to be any boasting. Yeah, boasting in how good you are. But you never replace something and don't put something in its place. So yeah, I don't boast in myself. I don't boast in what good I can do to have a relationship with God. No, 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 that's not what I boast in. But I do boast in the hope of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 said what? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. His perfection, but not just his perfection, but a relationship. What, I, what, what Adam and Eve had in the garden, unlimited access to God, unhindered peace with God, relationship with God and all that goes on with it, talking to God, knowing they're accepted by God, having to be a friend with God, to be a child of God. All of that was the glory of God, but our sin caused us to fall short of what God desired for us. But now we come to chapter five and we say because of Jesus, he's replaced where we've fallen short and he's given us the hope again of what? Of the glory of God. Of everything that sin took, Jesus gave us again See, that word hope in our English means to want something without certainty. I hope this will happen, but there's not certainty in that, is there? I hope I get that raise this week. I hope I get that playing time this week. I hope that I have do well on this test this week. I hope that this happens. I hope that that's not the word for hope. Because when I use that word and you do, there's not the level of certainty. But this word in the Bible, hope, in the New Testament, means looking forward or trusting in something with certainty. There's no hope if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. See, the certainty that I have to hope isn't based on circumstances. It's based on the certainty of God's love for me. That's why you can have hope. That's why you can have unshakable hope. And the reason why this is listed third in verses one and two is because the more we experience and live into that peace with God, and we're gonna talk about in a moment what that looks like, and the more that we we value and spend time with God and and enjoy that access to that, to, to God, you know what happens? We start hoping in different things. You know what does that more than anything else? Man, it's when we go through really difficult times. Because what it does is it starts to eliminate those things that we were hoping on. Those uncertainties based on circumstances. And when you go through suffering and when you go through difficulty, what it does is it causes you to those things that you were hoping on, holding on to for your hope, they start to slip through your fingers. So the only thing that you can grab is the thing that you should always have been grabbing. And that is your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So here's the question that I want to answer. It's really a so what question. Because for some of you, I don't know that I've given you anything new. Like this is all doctrine of salvation, right? Unhindered peace with God, unhindered, or, um, unlimited access to God, unshakable hope in, in God. 
But how are these benefits of justification, how are they difference makers for navigating through life? Like how do they actually make a difference in your, starts with a T, today? Well, I want to answer that question in the remaining verses because I think there's two ways. It's found in verses 3 all the way through 11. This unhindered peace with God, this unlimited access to God, this unshakable hope in God, here's what it provides you today. Number one, purpose in the pain of your suffering. Because in a crowd like this, watching me online, I've been doing this for 21 years as a pastor. Here's what I know. And if I wasn't doing this, I'd know that this was true of my own life, regardless of if I was pastoring or not. We are all going to encounter suffering, adversity, whatever word you want to use to describe it, affliction in the passage that I'm reading in Romans 5 through the Christian Standard Bible. But let's look at verses 3 through 5. Look at it with me. And not only that, We just don't boast in the hope of the glory of God, but this seems crazy. We boast in our afflictions. Really? I'm not sure the last time I encountered suffering, I was like, yes, I love it. I want more of it. Bring it on. We boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction or suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope, and this hope will not disappoint us. If you're writing in your Bible, I encourage you to write your name above that word us. This hope will not disappoint, Johnny, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But we've got to ask this question, what in the world does boasting in our affliction mean? And the way that we answer that is we, we got we to gotta understand and look at what it's not saying, okay? Because it, it's important the words that are used here. It doesn't say we boast for afflictions. Like it's not saying I love it, I want more of it, bring it on, I eat it for breakfast. Because everybody would be like, bro, you're lying. No, you don't. And if you thought that, you're crazy, there's, you have other problems that need to be addressed this morning. It doesn't say we boast for afflictions, but what does it say? We boast in suffering or afflictions. You know why? Because sometimes it's unavoidable. Suffering sometimes is unavoidable. Why? Because we live in a sinful world. You can't always run from it or avoid it. Sometimes it finds you. And there's times as well, hear me on this, that God doesn't want you to run from it. But he wants you to allow him to walk you through it. I've said this about myself before. So I love to be in control. Even though I know I'm not, I still love to think that I am. I love to be in control. That's how I respond to fear. Fear is one of my greatest common struggles. I've come to realize that about myself. And so the way that I react to fear when I'm afraid is I try to control it. And even though in my mind I know that I'm not in control, I still want to latch on to things that make me think that I am. And so for Most of my life, what I would do and the way that 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 would play itself out is if I felt like um, I was in a a friendship or I was in a situation that I felt like I could no longer control it and suffering was on the horizon because because of that person's probably going to do that to me or that person's going to make me experience pain or that's not going to go well for me. What I would do when I reached the point that I didn't believe I could control it anymore is I would run from it. That's how, I, that's how I live my life. But what I learned in my life is there's sometimes that either you can't, even though you try, or there's sometimes that you just feel an overwhelming sense that God's saying, don't run. I'm going to use that in your life.
And I want you, rather than running from it, to look through it, to walk in it, so that you can focus not on the circumstances, but on the certainties of what I'm going to do through that suffering. And Paul emphasizes how there's purpose in the pain of suffering. Let me give you these. First of all, suffering produces perseverance. The word in my translation is endurance. Maybe yours says perseverance. Here's what that word literally means. Strength under difficult circumstances. That's what it means. It's time under tension. Like have you ever had a personal trainer? Have you ever spent any time at the gym? Or you, or you watched a streaming service of, of any exercises? You're familiar with that word. Time under under tension. Some of us are like, man, I don't want to work out. I hate working out. So I'm literally going to find the lightest weight and I'm just going to bang through my reps so that I can feel better about myself and be done. But if you've ever done that, you know there's significance of what? The way that you grow muscle, the way that you pr produce endurance is what? Time under tension. It's unavoidable. Because what does it produce? It produces endurance. It produces perseverance. And I wish this wasn't the case. Hear me on this? I so wish this wasn't the case. But patience always is a part of perseverance. We're like, okay, I'll, I'll do the suffering. Okay, God, I'm, gonna, you're, I'm, I'm not going to run from this. There's no way I can run from this. This is out of my control. So, so, so God, I, I, can't, I can't do that. So, God, you're obviously going to walk me through this time of suffering adversity. And so, okay, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient today. And, and, okay, I walked through it today. Now, tomorrow I want it to be over. Nobody wishes that more than me, I promise you. But what God has taught me and is teaching me and will teach me until I'm in the presence of Jesus is that there are times when God is saying, no, 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 you can't run from this. But I'm going to walk with you through this. And I want you to have a certainty and understanding that this suffering I'm going to use to produce perseverance in your life. Here's the second thing suffering produces. It produces poise. Poise. Paul says in verse 3, we know that suffering or affliction produces endurance. And what does endurance or perseverance produce? Proven character. That word literally means tested. Poise. It's the confidence that comes from having been through difficult circumstances. And it only comes as the result of perseverance. Like you can't shortchange it. You're like, okay, I want poise, but I don't want to persevere. It's the result of perseverance. You don't get it without persevering through, through suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but let's say we were all in the military, and we were, and we're about to go into a battle, and, and we have the plan laid out, and, and, and everything's laid out, and we're about to go into battle, and we're about to, you know, there's fear involved in that. There, you're scared uh, what that's going to look like about the adversity that you're going to face, and your, and your superior officer who's supposed to walk you into battle says, hey guys, by the way, before we go out into battle, I just want you to know, I've never done this before. Can you imagine? Hey guys, we're about to literally go into a battle where you may lose your life or you may suffer in some way. And I just want you to know, all this is theory. I've done this, never done this before in my entire life. But who do you want to follow? Who do you want to listen to? What story has an impact in your life? It's the ones who have learned to persevere. Because they've 
learn to persevere. And their trust in God is stronger. Man, they got poise. They're not rattled as much because their faith has been tested. The Salem Chapel family of faith that isn't tested is a faith that's hard to trust. And I love that Paul is like, you want to know how unhindered peace and unlimited access and unshakable hope that God gives you through Jesus Christ actually makes a difference today? It's when you endure suffering. It's understanding in those times where you can't run from it and it's unavoidable that God is actually going to do something in you. But what gives me the faith to trust that he's going to walk through me in it? It's God's love for me. It's that he saved me. It's that he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. So that actually gives me the faith to trust. Okay, God, even though this doesn't seem joyous, even though this seems hard, I'm going to persevere with your strength because I know you're doing something in me. You're building my strength and you're building my poise because there's someone else in life who needs to hear my story. There's someone else in life that needs to hear about my faith and what I've walked through. There's someone else in life who's going to be further behind me who I can use what I have learned. What God has taught me, what God has forged in my soul. And so I'm not going to boast for our suffering, boast for affliction, Oh, but I'm going to boast in it because I know perseverance is going to be the result. I know the poise is going to be a result. Here's what else suffering produces. It produces perspective. Why? Much like what we talked about an unshakable hope in God, that being a benefit, is because suffering starts to, the things that I've looked to for confidence all of a sudden those things start to vanish away. That's why I wish it was the case, but nothing grows your faith more than adversity. Nothing. And Paul is showing the benefits of justification are not diminished when you suffer. They're actually enlarged by it. Did you hear me on that? The benefits of justification, that peace with God, that access to God, that hope in God are not diminished by suffering, adversity, affliction, whatever you want to call it. They're actually enlarged by it. See, if you face suffering, clinging to the reality that you're saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ, your joy in the midst of that suffering will deepen Because you're like, God, there was nothing in me that would have caused you to want to save me. That's how much you love me. So a God who loves me that much is not going to abandon me in the suffering. No, he's actually going to use it. He's going to give purpose in the pain of it. But here's the problem. If you face suffering with the mindset that you're actually saved by your works, suffering will break you. It won't make you because you're living your life constantly bargaining with God. Wait a minute, God, didn't you see the good that I did here? Didn't you see what I did here? Didn't you see how I did this for you and 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 I did this for you? All of those works should cause me not to experience this right now. You see, the danger of when you think that you're saved by your works is you view your relationship with God as transactional. But the whole point of Romans 2 and Romans 3 and Romans 4 is there's nothing that I can do to ever do enough good to have a relationship with God. But when I understand that I'm saved by grace and it's a gift of God, then I also understand that that same loving God is not going to abandon me in the suffering, but he's actually going to use it. 
and that suffering is a result of sin. It's not some vengeful God up there that wants to play games with me. No, no, no. His love actually restores me from the sin of this world and of my life. See, what I'm hoping this today, this morning, is that we can use God's word to answer the question, man, how do the benefits of justification, how are they a difference maker in me navigating through life? How does unhindered peace, unlimited access, unshakable hope make a difference in my life? Well, number one, they provide pain, provide purpose in the pain of suffering. But here's the second thing, and we'll be done. It provides assurance to the doubts that accompany suffering. Because there will be doubts. Must be real. There will be doubts. God, how could I be going through this and you love me? Like, I've done everything that you've asked me to do, although not perfectly. But God, when I've sinned, I've confessed it. Lord, I've said no to so many things. Why all of a sudden now is it not working out the way that I want? Those doubts will be there. But the benefits of the justification that God gives you through Jesus Christ, that peace, that access to God, that hope, man, what it'll do in suffering is it'll provide assurance when those doubts come. Because suffering can and will lead you to a false conclusion that God doesn't love you. You need to understand that. But here's the whole point of verses 6 through 11. It's Paul is emphasizing, but here's the truth. That God loves you because. God loves you because Jesus died for you when you were at your worst. Not your best. Can we just read verses 6 through 11? Let's just allow God's word to speak to whatever you're struggling with. Say it with me. Whatever you're struggling with today. Verse 6, for while we were still helpless, don't raise your hand. How many of you are feeling right now helpless? After you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because of some suffering, adversity, affliction that you're facing. You know what Paul does? He says, let me remind you of who you were before you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You were helpless. But look at this. I have this underline in my Bible. At the right time. Can we just read those four words together? Are you with me? One, two, three. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely would someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone may dare to die. In other words, you know, you might say to yourself, Okay, I love my spouse, I, I, I love my girlfriend or boyfriend, I, I love my kids, and, and, and I hope that if I was in a situation that I would want to give my life for them. But why are you doing that? Because you love them, because you're like, th- th- there's good in them. But God's different. Verse 8, but God... God's not like you and me. God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Salem Chapel family, Jesus died for you when you were at your worst, not your best. That thing that still haunts you, that you thought you would have never been capable of, but you did it, And even though you know it's forgiven through Jesus, the devil loves to still bring it up in your mind and say you're not good enough. Listen to me, that point, whenever you think you're at your worst, that's when God says, I want you. Verse nine, how much more? Like how much more then, since we now have been justified By his blood, will we be saved from his wrath, from his judgment? Verse 10, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled, made right with God through the death of his son Jesus. Then how much more, having been reconciled or made right, will we be saved by his 
life. Like if his death on the cross saved us from the judgment because Jesus died when that's what my sin required of me, but Jesus died in my place. But because he's been risen again, how much more can I enjoy a relationship with God now having already been saved? The benefits aren't just for eternity, they're for today. Verse 11, and not only that, like he just keeps going. Not only that, you thought that was good, but here's some more. You thought that was good, not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in what suffering's gonna produce. And the reason why we can do that is because we boast in who Jesus Christ is, through whom we have now received this reconciliation Paul is saying this Salem Chapel family you can know objectively and beyond all doubt that God loves you in the suffering in the doubts that peace isn't going away it's unhindered that access isn't going away because it's unlimited that hope isn't going away because it's unshakable why Because you had nothing to do with your salvation. Jesus did it all. And if Jesus did it all for my sin, then Jesus is also going to do it all in the midst of my suffering. And he's going to use it to produce someone who has perseverance, who has poise, and who has perspective. I want to close with this, this passage that we know so well to remind us of the security that we have in Jesus Christ. John 10, 27 through 29, Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, not just in the good, but also through the suffering. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Greater than the suffering, greater than the adversity, greater than the affliction, greater than your doubts. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Salem Chapel, here's what you have this morning. You've got some verses now to go to to remind you how the gospel doesn't just make a difference for eternity but it actually will make a difference for your today. Would you stand with me this morning? God, I thank you today for the reminder for some of us the revelation for others of us on what we have by being justified by you through Jesus Christ. And God, for those that are suffering today, Lord, may they remind themselves that though suffering is not enjoyable, God, it serves a purpose and you're not gonna waste it. And so God, may they have the trust to believe that if you love them enough to save them from their sins and to have a relationship with you for all of eternity, then God, you're gonna do something in this suffering as well. Lord, we look to you this morning. We plead the blood over every circumstance, over every obstacle, over every adversity. In Jesus' name, amen. is to sing just respond to the gospel here and now I draw about you against every weapon that's formed the thief and his plans will pass over when he sees the red on the door sing out I plead the blood I plead the blood of Jesus I plead the blood I plead the blood
Amen. Well, it's been so good to worship all together. I want to invite you to take your seat. Check out this video on the screen. Hey, Salem Chapel, you probably heard us mention the construction of the M3 Innovation Center over the last few months, and we know we've been talking about it a lot because, quite frankly, we're excited to see how God's going to use it. And today, we've got good news. It's almost finally ready for us to move in. If you're new with us, let me catch you up. Two years ago, we tried to answer the question, what does it look like to mobilize disciples after we've made them? And one of the answers that developed out of this time was what is now the M3 Innovation Center, a place for us to train the people of our church and serve those in our neighborhood. This 8,000 square foot fully renovated space will be used by our student ministry Thrive, as well as a place for life group meetings, restore groups, and other discipleship opportunities. Our friends and neighbors in the community will be able to use this facility as a co-working and meeting space, something not currently available in the Boston Thurman area. And it will be a place for community gatherings, wedding receptions, and other events for the people of our city. And it's all completely paid for. We're opening this building 100% debt free. So here's where you come in. On Sunday, March 10th, you are invited to come see this new space for yourself. Right after both services, we will have an open house for you to walk through the space, celebrate all that the Lord has provided through this project, and dream about the missional opportunities God will open through this space as we continue making, mobilizing, and multiplying disciples in our church and community. So that's Sunday, March 10th, after both the 9 and 11 a.m. services. We are excited to see what the Lord continues to do, and we want you to be a part of it. So thank you for your patience, your giving, and your trust in us through this entire project. We can't wait for you to see it. All right, church. Yes, yeah, so March the 10th. It's going to be an exciting day here. Looking forward to opening up those doors. And for many of you seeing what it looks like in there for the very first time, we're excited about how God is going to use the M3 building to fuel the mission that we have to make and mobilize disciples here at Salem Chapel. Uh, just want to let you know about a couple quick things before we take off today. Uh, one, the first kind of gatherings that we are having in the new M3 Center will actually take place the following Saturday, March the 16th. We'll have a men's and a women's gathering, kind of back to back. So men, you guys will start first at 8 a.m. to 9.30, and the ladies you'll follow from 10 to 11.30, just a time to get together, spend some time with each other. We haven't got to do that in a while, just guys or just ladies, get around God's word, encourage one another, and bonus, will be in the new uh, M3 Innovation Center. And so make sure you go to our website, salemchapel.org slash events, and you can register for those two events there. Uh, one other thing that you can find also on the events page is coming up, or I know Easter is really not that far away from us. That's at the end of March on the 31st. Something you should be aware of is we're going to be having baptisms uh, that Sunday morning on Easter Sunday. And so if you have a need to be baptized or if you have questions about baptism, you're just trying to decide like, this is this something that I should do as someone's trying to follow Jesus. We're having a baptism workshop actually the Sunday before Easter on the 24th. And so if if you've got questions, I'd love to sit down with you, answer your questions about baptism, walk through what God's word has to say about it, and then you have a choice. Like, do I want to follow? We'll get you signed up for baptisms on March the 31st. So make sure you put March the 24th on your calendar for that baptism workshop, and you can sign up on our website for that as well. Well, church, I want to thank you for the ways that you're faithfully giving already here uh, to Salem Chapel. Of course, that is part of our worship as we follow Jesus to be good stewards of the resources that he's given us. But also, just so you know, that's what fuels many of the mission that you see that we are doing as a church here. And so I want to invite you, there's three ways you can give each and every week. One are the boxes at the back of the auditorium or in the lobby, or you can give online at any time, salemchapel.org slash give, or you can text the amount to 84321 to put in your gift that way as well. Well, church, can I invite you to stand as we close our services out this morning? And also like to say, if you'd like to wish 
our DR team uh, the best as we head off. Many of them will be in the lobby today at the back. If you would like to say hello and give them a hug and let them know you're praying for them, we'd love to, to receive you there. Let's read you 24 and 25 together today, reminding us of our, what is ours in Jesus Christ. We just talked about this morning. Read it with me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you, church.